We start chapter six today, and uh, we're going to add to our list of parent functions, that family of parent functions that uh, we're going to be dealing with throughout the course of this year. And today we're going to talk about uh, exponential functions, and there's really uh, two primary types. We're going to be talking about exponential growth and exponential decay. And then we've got transformations of those uh, based on those same transformation principles that we've already dealt with in the past. So let's just jump right in for uh, with an example of this parent function for exponential growth. And, and I've given it to you in general here. The function will be some number that we call here b raised to a power. And for exponential growth, this b number is going to be greater than 1. We're going to look at exponential decay in just a minute. And that means the B number will be between 0 and 1. It'll be a fraction or a decimal. And so uh, let's just uh, take a look at a specific example. We'll just put an actual number in for B and uh, just kind of get an idea of how this looks. So I've chosen a B number greater than 1. So I chose 2 raised to the X power. And so if you think about some uh, inputs, uh, we'll just do a little table here. Uh, if we let the exponent be 0, 2 to the 0 power is 1. So there is a y-intercept of 1 for this parent. And that's going to be true for all, no matter what this number is for b, when we raise that number to the 0 power, it's going to become 1. So for the parent, the y-intercept is always going to be 1. Now when we transform that. We have vertical stretch or compression or reflections. Obviously, that's going to change things, but just the basic parent is going to have a y-intercept of 1. So uh, if I let the exponent be 1, 2 to the first power is 2, so there's 1, 2. Uh, if I let the exponent be 2, 2 to the second is 4, 2, 4. And you're going to see that it just keeps on going up. Um, if I let x be 3, I'm going to get 9, 4, 16, 5, 32, and so on. But you get the picture of how uh, it's rising, it's increasing from left to right. All right, so now let's go the other way. Let's let x be negative 1, and 2 to the negative 1 power is 1 half. And... 2 to the negative 2 power is 1 fourth. So what happens is as I choose numbers that approach negative infinity on the x-axis, I'm getting closer and closer and closer to this x-axis. I won't ever actually get there because there is no way to make this number, I, there's no way to plug a number in for x to cause this function to actually equal 0. And being on the x-axis would mean that uh, that is a zero of the function, a number that we could plug in for x to cause zero. That's not possible. So this is, uh, this is a new term. Uh, whenever I have a graph that a, approaches a line but never actually gets there, that's called an asymptote. And I'll just kind of jump ahead. Um, as we come up with key characteristics for this parent function, we have a horizontal asymptote. Asymptotes can be horizontal, they can be vertical. Later on, we'll learn that they can be oblique, which means slanted. So this particular graph has a horizontal asymptote, and it's actually this horizontal line, uh, y equals 0, or also known as the x-axis. Okay? So uh, let's just uh, write down some key characteristics. Uh, what type of graph is, is it? Uh, well, it's continuous. It's one-to-one. -one. Uh, we talked about um, how do we know if a graph is one-to-one. -one. We talked about this first semester. Uh, we can perform the horizontal line test, and every time we draw a horizontal line, we only touch one point on the graph. And it's also increasing, increasing. So always we always tell increasing or decreasing from left to right. 
And as we move from left to right, it's going to continue to go upward in that fashion. Okay, the domain is going to be all reals, and we'll just use interval notation. The range, however, is going to be only those numbers from zero, and we're not going to include zero. We already talked about how that will never get to a point where y actually equals zero. So it'll go from zero to positive infinity. We talked about the uh, asymptote line y equals zero. That's a line that we always approach as x approaches negative infinity. We will always approach that line, but we'll never actually get there. And so that asymptote line is y equals zero. And I'll throw one more th out here. Uh, we have a y-intercept of one. We talked about that earlier. Okay, so that's the parent for exponential growth. Now, um, let's just do this quick little example. Uh, once again, if I input 0, 4 to the 0 is 1, so there's my y-intercept. If I input 1, I get output 4. Input 2, output 16. I'm just going to put that up here. Input negative 1, I get a 4th. Negative 2, I get a 16th. And as I choose more negative numbers, I just, again, approach the x-axis forever, but I'll never actually get there. Approach but never touch. That's basically, I, I shouldn't say never. There are some unusual occasions where asymptote lines can be crossed over, but uh, we'll talk about that more in a future lesson. But uh, for now, you can just understand an asymptote as this line that we will approach the x-axis in this case, but we never touch. The domain uh, is going to be all reals, and the range will be all the numbers greater than zero, not including zero. Okay, so uh, let's talk about some transformations. This is really going to be a review. Um, the A number, once again, will determine vertical stretch or compression. If A is negative, that causes a reflection over the x-axis. Um, the H number will tell me how to move horizontally, and we've dealt with that in the past. And the K number will tell me how to move vertically. So I'm going to do this by uh, basically transforming the parent, or translating. We don't really have a transformation here because uh, A is understood to be 1. So that really doesn't do any vertical stretch or compression. So uh, this is going to be a translation, and it's going to move our parent. So let me just put my parent up there. We dealt with this earlier. Um, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 4, negative 1, 1 half, negative 2, 1 fourth, and we don't even have to connect them, but those dots would represent the parent, and uh, we'll do the blue as a translated parent. So, um, again, H is actually negative 3, so be careful, the horizontal move is always the opposite of the way it looks, so all of my parent points are going to shift 3 to the left, and then they're going to shift 5 down. Okay, So just take each of your parent points and go left 3 and then down 5. And once you've done that, you have your graph. Okay, so the blue actually represents the graph. So you have to be careful. Uh, we essentially have, well, we didn't hit those very well. Try that again. We essentially have a new horizontal asymptote, and this K number will determine uh, what your horizontal asymptote is. So I'm not saying that you actually have to draw this line 
but when you sketch your graph, your graph should not dip below y equals negative 5. So if you want to help yourself, maybe safeguard against losing some points, if you were to draw this going down forever below negative 5, that would be partially incorrect. So uh, that would be my graph. I shifted. I did the translation. And now let's do uh, domain and range. So domain is still all reals. The range, however, has changed since I shifted five units downward. Then uh, that means that I'm going to be having all the numbers greater than negative five, but not including negative five. Okay, so that's an example of a translation. Now let's do uh, this example where the A number is less than 1. It's between 0 and 1. And so that's going to be um, a, an example of compression. Okay, so uh, let's just take the parent y equals 6 to the x. Let's just go ahead and put that on here. So y-intercept 1, uh, 1, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And obviously 2, 36 is going to be way up there. So I'm just going to use those two points. Uh, negative 1, 1, 6. Negative 2, 1, 36. So let's go ahead and do a little table here for my parent, 0, 1, 1, 6, 2, 36, negative 1 would be 1, 6, and negative 2, 1, 36. Okay, so what you can do now is uh, with a calculator, you can illustrate the effect of multiplying by point 0.1, which we said earlier was going to result in vertical compression. So we're going to take the original parent table, and I am interested in you being able to identify these effects. So I'm going to call this table uh, times 0 0.1. And since that's vertical compression, I'm only multiplying the y-coordinate. Each of these y-coordinates would be multiplied by 0 0.1. So this first move, I'm not doing anything uh, to the x-coordinate. I'm just going to rewrite those. And then uh, let's just take our calculator. And uh, obviously, 1 times 0.1. And uh, that would be 0 0.6. 3. And uh, 3.6. Uh, 1 sixth. times 0.1 is 0 0.01, we'll just call it 0 0.017, and then 136 times 0.1, and we'll just say that's 0 0.003. Okay, and now uh, we're going to do the down. There is no horizontal shift. There's only a downward shift, so I'm going to call this table down 3. So once again, our x-coordinates are not affected. So each of the y-coordinates to accomplish a downward shift of 3 units, we just take these y's and subtract 3. So that's negative 2.9. Negative 2.4, that should be 0 0.6. Negative 2.983. And negative... 2.997. So this is the table that I'm actually going to plot for the finished product here. So almost at negative 3 as the y-intercept, 0 
and real, real close to negative three, one, and about negative two and a half, two, and just about a half, negative one, and even closer to three, negative two, and even closer to three. So you can see how I'm going to be approaching negative three. I'm going to be approaching negative three forever and ever, but never get there. That is my horizontal asymptote. And there is my graph. And so um, I know um, with a graphing calculator, uh, you can just get this to show up pretty easily. But uh, let me just go back to our objectives. One of our objectives in this class is we want you to, this, this is key, identify the effect of the graph by replacing f of x by all of these different values. You should be able to know uh, without a calculator what the effect is on the parent when you have this a value being multiplied, when you have a number here for h, number for k, and so walking through these tables is a good way of helping you remember the effect, the uh, transformation principles that we've talked about. Okay, so um, I want to give you a little help, and then I'm going to see if you can actually sketch the graph for number 19. Uh, we had this word problem, and these exponential growth or decay word problems will start like this. And this is going to be an example of exponential growth, and we know that because the virus is spreading through a network of computers, and ever, every minute, 25% more computers are affected, infected. So obviously, the number of computers that are being infected is growing. So this is an exponential growth word problem. The virus began at one computer, graph the function for the first hour of the spread of the virus. So for these word problems, for whether it's growth or decay, uh, you're going to start here. And let me just identify uh, the parts of this function that may help you when you're doing these uh, word problems. The, the number that we typically, if we're graphing, we would say that it's our uh, vertical stretch or compression number. Um, in these word problems, you can think of that as the initial value. What number did you start with? And if you look at this uh, problem, it says it started at one computer. So in this particular problem, A is going to be 1. Okay, the number in this B spot is going to be either exponential growth factor or it's going to be an exponential decay factor. Well, since this is a growth problem, B is going to be a growth factor. And the way you come up with B is you always start with 1, always, whether it's growth or decay. You will start with the number 1, and you will add the rate of growth. Okay, so in this problem, you're told that the rate of growth is 25% uh, more computers are infected with each passing minute. So to get my growth factor, I start with 1, and I add the decimal form of 25%, and obviously that makes my B number 1.25. And then x is always going to be a time interval, whether that's months, years, days. Um, in this particular problem, it's actually minutes. The um, virus is spreading at a certain rate per minute. So we put all this together, and we have this function. a is 1, so we don't need to write 1. B is the growth factor of 1.25, and 
and then we'll leave x as the input and it's going to be a number of minutes so when i do this graph the x-axis will be a certain number of minutes and then y will be the number of computers infected all right and so i'm going to let you take it from there and uh, basically sketch the graph of this, y equals 1.25 to the x, knowing that your input for x will be a number of minutes, and then based on that number of minutes, how many computers are infected. Okay, so now let's shift gears and we'll talk about exponential decay. Well, you'll notice that the function really looks pretty much the same. The huge difference, however, is this b number uh, for growth, that the B number had to be greater than 1. For decay, it's going to be between 0 and 1. It'll be a, a decimal or a fraction. Okay, so uh, much like we did in our previous example with growth, let's just put a number in for B. Let's just say 1 half to the X. All right, well, same thing is uh, true as we saw with growth. If we let X be 0, we get output 1. So there's my um, y-intercept. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and include that as part of our key characteristics. So that's a similarity with growth. Uh, if I do input 1, I get output 1 half. If I do input 2, I get output 1 fourth. So you can see right away just the opposite is going to be true. Now I'm going to be approaching the positive x-axis going from left to right. If I do input negative 1, I get output 2, input negative 2, output 4. four. So this is classic uh, exponential decay. We have a continuous. One to one, but this time it's decreasing. Always uh, increasing, decreasing is always from left to right. Domain is still going to be all reals. Range will be same as before. It starts at zero, not including zero, going to positive infinity. Well, let me put that down here. And we still have that same uh, asymptote. We're approaching it from a different direction, but it's still the same. It's that line y equals 0 or the x-axis. And uh, we've already identified that there's a y-intercept of 1. So the way we do these graphs is pretty much the same as we did with uh, exponential growth. Uh, we'll go ahead and do this one uh, real fast. Um, if we input 0, output is 1. If I input 1, I get a third. 2, I get a ninth. So you should show your graph for bigger numbers for x. You should be getting closer to the x-axis. And for more negative numbers for x, like negative 1 would give you an output of 3. Negative 2 would be an output of 9. And this is a pretty simple graph exponential decay, uh, domain, uh, all reals, range, since we didn't translate it, uh, we go from zero to positive infinity. Okay, well, our transformation principles are just like they were before. Uh, so uh, let's just run through this problem real fast. Uh, we'll start with the parent y equals one fourth to the x power. Let's just uh, do a little table for that. Uh, 0, 1, 1, 1 fourth, 2, 1 sixteenth, negative 1, 4, negative 2, 16. Okay, so we have um, really three things. So I'm just going to walk through this table uh, times 2 would be the next thing that I take care of. I just take these from left to right. Uh, this is called a vertical stretch. 
And so I'm going to multiply the y coordinates only by 2 to accomplish that vertical stretch. So the, y, the x coordinates at this point are not being affected with this next step. So if I take each y coordinate and multiply by 2, I get 2, 1 half, 1 eighth, 8, and 32. And now let's go ahead and do the translation. And uh, the translation will be left 2, down 3. So to accomplish that, to go left 2, I subtract 2 from each x. 0 minus 2, 1 minus 2, 2 minus 2, negative 1 minus 2, negative 2 minus 2. And I subtract 3 from each y. 2 minus 3, negative 1. 1 half minus 3 is negative 2 and a half. 1 eighth minus 3 is negative 2 and 7 eighths. 8 minus 3 is 5. 32 minus 3 is 29. And so these are the points that I'm actually going to plot for my final answer. So uh, maybe I'll do these in blue. Negative 2, negative 1. Negative 1, negative 2 and a half. 0, negative 2 and 7 eighths. Just getting a little closer to negative 3. Negative 3, 5. And that one point is the only one that's going to be off, and I'll just say that this is going to be my 29, negative 4, 29. So again, uh, you have to be careful with these uh, horizontal asymptotes, so don't just make this graph dip below y equals negative 3. This k number will always indicate what your uh, horizontal asymptote is. This is y equals negative 3. Okay, and um, state the domain and range. So domain is uh, all reals. And the range is from negative 3, not including negative 3, to positive infinity. Okay, so um, hopefully you've seen enough. I'm going to just kind of set this one up. Uh, you can start with the parent, okay, get your table. Just use those same inputs, 0, plus, minus 1, plus, minus 2. Uh, do the, it's really two things. You're, you're, you have a reflection here, and you also have vertical stretch. So you're going to multiply the y coordinates only times negative 3. That will flip your graph over and also stretch it, going negative. And then you can combine these two in the same table. Uh, this is going to go right for up two. So you're going to add four to each of your x's, and you're going to add two to each of your y's. And then when you finish that table, you will have it. That will be the five points that you plot, and um, you should be good to go. Okay, uh, let's do uh, a word problem involving exponential decay. One of the more popular exponential decay problems in real life involves something called depreciation. Uh, depreciation is an accounting term which indicates how much a an asset, uh, some type of property or equipment, uh, how much it loses value over time. You know, a, a brand new SUV started off being valued at $30,000, but over time and usage, it's obviously not going to be worth that much. And so the dollar amount that it goes down over time and with usage is called depreciation. So when you do these, again, when you do these word problems involving growth or decay, they, they're very similar. They both start off like this. And A is still the initial value. It's just that in decay problems, this is called the decay factor. Okay, so just one more time. 
A will be the starting value of whatever the asset is. In this case, B is called the decay factor. And to get the decay factor, it's much like growth, except we start with one and we subtract the rate of decay. So in this case, it's going down in value by 15%. So I do 1 minus 0.15, and the decay factor is 0.85. And x is still a time interval, and in this case, it refers to a number of years. So my function for this new SUV, it started at $30,000. That's my initial value. I have a decay factor of 0.85, and I'm going to be, I'm going to leave this open. X will be a certain number of years, and Y will be the dollar amount of the SUV after that number of years has passed with that decay rate. So uh, I'm going to let you maybe take it from there. Uh, that That's the function, and then see if you can... Um, See if you can sketch the graph. The value of the SUV will be the y-axis. Number of years that have passed will be the x. Okay, and uh, that's that's it. And uh, I hope uh, this helps you to get you ready to do the homework um, problems that are presented here. If you have any questions, let me know.